Would you please pray with me? Father, if we could only see the world and our nation and each other through your eyes, what a difference we would experience. Jesus said, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Lord, I pray we would, we would experience that collective unity together. We lift up the people around the world who are suffering, that they might experience relief and peace and comfort. And just as we scroll through the headlines, Father, we see evidence of poverty, injustice, war, hunger, earthquakes, tsunamis, the list just goes on and on, one crisis after another. And Father, we know that we live in a broken and troubled world, so we pray for hurting people. We pray that they have hope, the kind of hope that's found in you. Father, I raise up our own country, 2020, well, it's been a rough year, and it's not over yet. It's our choice, though, whether we view the events of this year through a lens of bitterness and anger or compassion and understanding. This morning, Father, I pray people would put their differences aside and treat each other with respect. I pray that our current leaders, as well as our newly elected leaders, would know you and seek you every day. And Father, I pray that each one of us would feel compelled to focus more on solutions than criticism, condemnation, and division. God, help us cherish our country and preserve the best that it has to offer. And open our eyes and let us acknowledge those aspects that can be and should be improved. Father, we turn our focus to our state, and I do pray for the leadership of our state, our counties, and our healthcare institutions. Give them wisdom and direction as they struggle to find solutions to issues we face. Put wise counsel in the path of decision makers. I pray for the safety of our emergency medical services, our healthcare workers, our teachers, and other essential workers as their families and they are at higher risk due to contact with those who may be infected with the virus. Father, we also pray a hedge of protection around those most vulnerable among us and comfort for those who have lost loved ones this year. And I echo Dawn's prayer from earlier. We just pray that the virus would relent, Father. And as we focus on our own church, sometimes our voices feel small and inadequate. But God, I would pray that you stir that thirst and the hunger to know you better in each and every one of us. We thank you for your grace and mercy and the reminder that you are in control. Help us focus on the truth of who you are rather than all those distractions that are vying for our attention. And I pray for a revival to the church overall, this church specifically, our community, and our nation as a whole. Let each one of us not only promote but also embody Christian values. Let us be an, a reflection of you and your love and the relentless pursuit to share the gospel with each and every person. We lay these requests at the throne of grace this morning, and thank you, Father, once again, that you are in control yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You will never fall off your throne. I pray these things for the good and for the glory of you, Lord. Amen.
Thank you so much, uh, Elder uh, Kimberly Telford. Uh, boy, feeding on prayers uh, like that, and I trust you are as well. Well, Calvin Miller is kind of well known in Christian circles, although he passed away in 2012. But Calvin uh, uh, Miller was a, a pastor. He was a professor at Beeson uh, Divinity School, um, and he was a much sought after speaker. And in one of his books that he wrote called The Mind of, of a Servant, he tells a story. And Calvin Miller says, I was coming back from Ridgecrest, and that was a student camp. Uh, and he said it was some years, years ago as he wrote that book. And he said there had been 3,000 students or so at this, at this camp that he was the main speaker. And he said this, they show up everywhere. You have absolutely no privacy at all. They show up in your shower for crying out loud. And it goes on for a whole week. And finally, he writes, you're on a plane and you're headed back home and you're thinking, oh Lord, thank you that I'm moving away from this place. Uh, now I, It was great, but I've had enough and I just need some time alone now. And because the Bible the Bible is uh, your last desperate defense. You pull up that Bible up around your face uh, to keep everybody away. You know, it's a frightening specter. Even a flight attendant uh, won't ask you if you want some peanuts or, or some pretzels if you have that Bible in front of your, of your face. And so he said, I said to the Lord, Lord, please, I just want to be alone for two or three hours on this flight before I get back to Omaha, Nebraska. But then, he writes, I became aware of a young man crying in the seat beside me. And he looked like a student. He looked like he was probably 19 or 20 years of age or so. And again, I, I said in my heart, Calvin Miller says, Lord, he's not mine. My, my concerns are all on the ground in Omaha. But he kept weeping. And finally, I put down my Bible and I said to him, son, I don't know what the matter is, but if there's anything uh, I can help you with, I I'd love to try to do so. He tragically told me that his mother and his father and his little sister had all been killed in a car accident in Asheville, North Carolina the day before while they were on vacation. Stunning. And he writes, suddenly my heart grew very still and silent. And then I began to feel his pain, or at least I tried to. And I turned to him and I said, I have no idea what this must feel like. I can't even imagine this. But I know someone who understands it perfectly. Then Calvin Miller took his Bible, behind which he had been hiding, and he shared with this young broken man about Jesus Christ. And he was able to lead this young man to faith in Christ on that airplane at 30,000 feet. But it was not the last thing that Calvin Miller did. He got off of his plane and called someone that he knew and asked that person to meet this young man where he was going to land. He needed help. Calvin Miller stepped to the plate. He writes this, you see the world is mine and I can't brush off somebody because I happen to sit by him and don't know him are her opportunities <laughs> opportunities is what I'm preaching about this morning God gives us multiple opportunities to speak to people to love people to help people and ultimately to build a relationship whether it's a short time or a longer time to build a relationship and tell them about his son Jesus if we are only open if we are only willing to be used by God He'll give us multiple opportunities. It's our privilege. It's our obligation. And you've probably heard plenty of sermons about uh, maybe shaming you for not sharing the gospel enough. It is an obligation, but I would rather look at it this way. It's a privilege, one that we gladly embrace for we have the best news that has ever fallen upon the ears of humankind. Is there anything quite like the joy and the thrill of leading someone to saving faith in Jesus Christ. We are his witnesses, and that's an incredible honor. 
Why am I on this topic this morning? Well, I'm preaching through the four pillars of Mountain Road Church. What, what is the very foundation, the bedrock of what we want our church to be? And there's four things. We want to be biblical. We want to be relational. We want to be intergenerational. We want to be missional. And so I've been preaching through those things first. Uh, we are, are biblical. We believe that the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments are the infallible and errant word of God. And that's our only rule of faith and practice. And then we desire to be relational. As God's transforming us from the inside and out, uh, we want to build community, a community filled with compassion and loyalty and trust where we truly know uh, one another, support one another, encourage one another, love one another unconditionally. And then I spent a couple of weeks talking about intergenerational. We have a lot of work to do with this here at Mountain Road Church, but we want to be a church for all ages where we do things together, we learn together, we grow together as young people, young adults, families uh, together. Every stage uh, of growth, a spiritual household. And then now the final pillar that I'll preach on for two weeks, this weekend, next week, we desire to be missional, and our mission statement goes like this. In humility, we join God in his mission of reconciling the world to himself. We reclaim our stewardship responsibilities, proclaim the reign of Jesus, and invite people everywhere to join his way of life. What a wonderful statement uh, that is. So I'm turning to a famous a scripture verse this morning, you've probably heard it preached on uh, before, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, it's, it's one of the great calls to us uh, to be his witnesses. And, and I've got three points that I'd like for us to, to consider this morning briefly. First of all, we want to look at, at our mission. And then secondly, uh, we want to, to look at our map. And then third, our momentum. So that's what we'll look at here this morning. Our mission, our map, and our momentum. Let's turn now to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is God's word. It's inspired by him. Jesus says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What a marvelous verse. Let's pray uh, together. God, I pray that, that you would give us a heart to share the hope that is within us. Give us boldness, but give us winsomeness and gentleness uh, as well. And I pray that you would so consume us that we can't help but speak of you and who you are and how you have changed us from the inside out and are still doing so. And so, God, I, I pray, inspire us uh, this morning. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart might be pleasing in your sight. For, God, you are my strength and my redeemer. God, I pray that Jesus would increase and that I would decrease. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. The first thing that we want to look at is our mission. Jesus says to his disciples shortly before uh, he ascends into heaven, he says, you will be my witnesses. And we understand a witness is one who knows something. A witness testifies to what they know. And so the disciples of Jesus Christ, which include us, we are to be witnesses to who Jesus is, what he has done. And so we're speaking of the gospel, which literally means the good news, uh, that there is a God in heaven and he wants a relationship with us, but our sins have separated us from his utter holiness. Jesus is the bridge uh, that, that, that uh, bridges that gap. And it's faith in him, it's trust in him, it's giving ourselves wholly to Jesus Christ that reconciles God to us, and that is uh, the gospel. We are witnesses for Christ. That message in the book of Acts is repeated 39 times in that book. If we are to be an effective witness for Christ, we can't be over on the sidelines cheering others on. We've got to be in the game of life. We need to roll up our sleeves and dive in, and our lives must display the inner reality of what we are externally proclaiming. There ought to not be a discord between how we live and what we say. That's a large reason why the gospel flames raced across Asia in the first century. Uh, the apostles, these Christians, walked their talk, and they spoke about Jesus. They were glad uh, to do so. To be a witness for Christ, we need 
three different things. We need logos, ethos, and pathos. Logos, ethos, and pathos. And by the way, the, that three-pronged uh, outline is how I prepare to preach every week. Logos first is, is the word. We have the logos. We have the word uh, of God, the word of Christ. We understand the gospel, at least the basics of the gospel. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The logos is the word. We understand the gospel. The ethos, though, is that it's become an inner reality in our lives. It's not simply what we say with our mouth, but it's a real living thing uh, in us, the gospel. We've embraced it, and it, it's, it's defined who we are. And then there's the pathos, and that is the passion that is brought uh, with the message. And so the apostles, the early Christians, had those th three things. The apostles were passionate for Christ. Peter at Pentecost, Stephen was passionate even at his own stoning. Paul before Felix, they all fervently testified to Jesus Christ. They all promoted their faith. They were a band of zealous believers who turned the world upside down. Are we turning the world upside down or is the world turning us upside down, dear one? When George Whitfield was getting people, the people of Edinburgh, out of their beds at 5 a.m. in the morning to come and hear his preaching, it was that good, a man on his way to the church met David Hume the Scottish philosopher and skeptic, atheist. Surprised at, at seeing David Hume on his way to hear Whitfield, the man said to him, well, I thought you did not believe in the gospel. And Hume replied, I do not, but he does. Whitfield was that compelling. And so should there be this conviction on our part this passion on our part, this zeal, this fervency. We have the logos, the word uh, of the gospel. We have ethos, it's changed us, it's our identity now. And, and we have pathos, passion, as we bring it to our friends, family, neighborhoods, to the ends of the earth, and I'll talk about that in a minute. At age 12, Robert Louis Stevenson was looking out into the dark from his upstairs window, and he was watching a man light the street lamps. And so his governess came into the room, and she saw him peering out the window, and she asked him what he was doing. And this is what he said, I am watching a man cut holes in the darkness. I am watching a man cutting holes in the darkness. Beloved, that's our mission. What a marvelous picture of, of our, our mission as Christ's witnesses and partakers of God's light. We are to be busy and have an urgency about cutting holes in the spiritual darkness, the blackness of our world, which is very black. And so are we, are you, cutting holes in the darkness? Now, we're to be zealous about this, but let me make a little sidebar comment. We're not to be obnoxious. <laughs> Sometimes uh, Christians are so zealous uh, to share the gospel that they become downright obnoxious with it. We're not supposed to be that way. We're to be winsome and wise, but we're to be those that share the hope that we have within us and not sit on that, not put a, a lampstand underneath a, a table. What is the key to all this? Uh, lots of times Christians uh, get really scared and, and, and they say, well, I can't really share my faith. It's so in intimidating. I'll tell you the key, the secret to sharing your faith. Build friendships. Build real friendships. You're not looking at a person as a project. You're building a real friendship. And as you sincerely, genuinely build a real friendship, then it opens up opportunities for you to share the gospel. That's our mission. Let's talk about our map. How far is our witness to spread? Jesus says, shocking words, startling words for them. He says, in Jerusalem and in, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We've heard it so many times that that we uh, have a difficult time feeling its impact. But I tell you, it was an absolute shock to the disciples and the early Christians. And this is why. They would say, Jerusalem, okay, that makes sense. But all Judea and Samaria, we're going to go minister to those half-breeds, and then even to the ends of the earth, that means the Gentiles too as well. The words were not only spiritually revolutionary, but socially and ethnically unheard of. 
But once they understood, they undertook it with a fury. The Lord's instructions were carried out uh, to the letter. Jerusalem was filled with the preaching of the gospel. 3,000 people came to Christ in one day. Later, Philip broke the taboos of Judea and crossed over into Samaria. It was a social revolution, not just a spiritual revolution. And this is what God has called us to as well. Alexander uh, McLaren, a Scottish uh, preacher who lived from 1826 to 1910, once said this, Barbarian, Scythian, bond and free, male and female, Jew and Greek, learned and ignorant, clasped hands and sat down at one table and felt themselves all one in Christ Jesus. They were ready to break all other bonds and to yield to the uniting forces that streamed out from his cross. There never had been anything like it. Uniting forces streaming out from his cross. That's what we're to be, beloved. Hispanic, black, white, Asian, educated, uneducated, blue collar, white collar, wealthy, poor, it does not matter. We should be united under his cross. How impressive the scope of the missionary heart. The followers of Christ yearn for the gospel to go to the very ends of the earth and into their own community. How can we have a burden for distant, unreached nations without a burden for our unreached neighborhoods as well? It's not an either or, it's a both and. Is that not right? And one pastor said, we need bifocal vision, a balance of being concerned close to home and committed to world evangelism. And so we're world Christians. We have a heart for our neighborhood and far uh, beyond to all the nations. That's why the missions committee of Mountain Road Church is now building relationships with missionaries in Japan and India. Not just here, but of course here and then beyond. It's our duty to cross over all ethnic divisions as well. The church should be a healing balm in the midst of all the injustice, uh, of all the hurt and healing that has occurred with the racism and the issues that we are confronting right now. We should be leading the way of reconciliation. Jesus' final words to us demand expansive hearts. It's a call for every believer, every forgiven sinner now following Christ to be spent uh, for him. And there's a zeal there, a passion, an urgency. What a call. And if we're not honest about it, then we say, well, this is just too much. It's overwhelming. It's too hard. And to demand that it go to the ends of the earth, it's impossible. Exactly. It is impossible. That's why our Lord prefaced his statement in our scripture this morning with a promised provision of power. And so we've looked at our mission, we've looked a bit at the map, and so now let's look at our momentum. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. There was a brief interlude of about 10 days, and then the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. And there were tongues of fire over them, and they spoke in other known languages, and spiritual power rolled through them. And so then it's no real surprise that Peter preached with passion and 3,000 came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. There's power. And later, when Peter walked by the beautiful gate and he saw a lame man, he said to the lame man, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And suddenly... There was a high-jumping cripple in front of the temple. That was power. John and Peter were standing before the entire Sanhedrin who were telling them to basically shut their mouth about this Jesus. And they said, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. That's our call. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. They had power. We can have that power too. And consider also the first gospel concert. Where did the first gospel concert take place? In Philippi, after Paul and Silas were, were beat up and tossed into the slammer, what were they doing? They were singing praise and worship and testimony. Power totally transformed disciples. 
When the Holy Spirit comes upon followers of Christ, the most unlikely people become fountains of power. The power of the Holy Spirit is the supreme qualification and assurance of Christ's witnesses. Is it good to learn to grow in apologetics, get more and more skilled with sharing the gospel? Of course that's true, but our main qualification, our supreme qualification for sharing the gospel is the power of the Holy Spirit. Consider the parallel between Jesus and his disciples when they were about to begin their respective ministries. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended upon him and strengthened him for his mission, his ministry, and to oppose the power of Satan. Before the apostles are able to assume this tremendous responsibility of building the church of Jesus Christ and to conquer the stronghold of Satan, they receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, the same is true for us as well. It's not our strength. It is not your eloquence or mine. It is not really about our abilities, although we can improve those our persuasiveness. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit. We must rely upon the Holy Spirit's power. How do we do that? We ask for it and we recognize that it is the Holy Spirit, not us, who changes hearts and minds. And it gives us confidence and it frees us up to share our faith. The word that Jesus uses here in Acts chapter 1-8 is a significant word. He uses the Greek word dynamis. The Greek word dynamis entered the English language when the Swedish chemist and engineer Alfred Bernard Nobel, who lived from 1833 to 1896, made the discovery that became his fortune. He discovered a power that was stronger than anything the world had known up to that time. And he asked a friend of his who was a Greek scholar what the word was for explosive power. And his friend said, the Greek word is dynamis. And Nobel said then, well, I'm going to call my discovery by that name. And so he called his explosive power dynamite. And that is the word that Jesus uses here. But you will receive power, explosive power, dynamite-like power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is not power that we have intrinsically. We have to receive it. Jesus says you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. The explosive, life-changing dynamic of the Holy Spirit operating through the proclamation of the gospel if we're only willing to open our mouths and share the truth that we know. This is not a political power. This is not a military power. It's not a monetary power. It's not legislative power. It is power that flows from God, and it's real power, real changes that come when the Holy Spirit uses the gospel to regenerate fallen men and women and young people, calling them to repent of their sin and to trust in Christ and give themselves up to him. Changes follow in a big way when that happens, and then you have reformation, and it's what we need, a modern reformation. It has to start with us. The gospel cuts holes in the darkness. It cuts holes in the blackness. The blackness of hatred and selfishness and discouragement and hopelessness and loneliness and a lack of purpose and meaning in life. The gospel cuts holes in that and brings light. It brings warmth, the warmth of love and serving others. Endless encouragement, eternal hope, a brand new family true purpose and meaning in life now and forever. And so I ask you as I wind down here, has the gospel cut through the holes of your darkness? Maybe you've never come to personal faith in Jesus Christ. Have you ever? Where you don't just believe it up here, but you receive it in here, in your heart. You not only believe in Jesus, but you ask him to come in and transform you from the inside out. You give yourself totally and wholly to him. That's... The gospel has the the holes of your darkness been cut through, sliced through, uh, through the love and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And so now then I ask, if you say, well, sure, uh, that's been true for me for many years. Are you now cutting holes in the darkness with the truth of Christ? Our mission is to be Christ's witnesses. Our map is to the very ends uh, of the earth. 
And it's not just the nations, it's our neighborhoods. It's not just our neighborhoods, it's the nations. And our momentum is the spirit of God, no less. Let me finish with the true story. One of the greatest missed opportunities, missed opportunities for the gospel in all of history took, back, took place way back in 1271, the 13th century, 1271. In 1271, Niccolo and Matteo Polo, the father and uncle of Marco Polo, they were visiting the Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan at that time was a world ruler. And he, were, he ruled in, in China, he ruled in India, and in all of the East. And he became attracted to the story of Christianity as Niccolo and Matteo told it to him. And he said this to them, you shall go to your high priest and tell him on my behalf to send me 100 men skilled in your religion. And so there will be more Christians here than there are in your parts. So what happened with that great invitation? Zero. Nothing happened. Two or three missionaries were sent about 30 years later. Too few, too late. Baffles the imagination to think what a difference the world would be if in the 13th century China became Christian. If in the 13th century India had become Christian. If in the 13th century the East had been won to Christ. What will be said of us? Nothing was really done. Too few, too late. Or will we have amazing power, the power of the Holy Spirit? God, give us zeal to tell others about his grace. It's our highest call and privilege. Let's pray together. God, I pray that you would let us get over our insecurities about sharing our faith. And Father, I, I pray that we would build genuine, sincere relationships of, of friendship and love and trust. And then, God, would it lead to faith conversations? So, Father, would you give us just immense passion to share the hope that is within us? That these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The greatest mission that was ever undertaken was when the second person of the triune God, the eternal Son of God, uh, took on flesh and bone and came and lived amongst us, did miracles, transformed people, told them about how to have a relationship with God the Father, laid down his life, was beaten, tortured, crucified at Calvary, buried and dead, rose three days later in glorious resurrection. And now he rules and reigns on high. And so Jesus uh, did not have to come on this mission, but a council in the Godhead, in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, Jesus gladly uh, came. That's the greatest mission. If we're talking about missions, uh, Jesus came with a mission uh, to save us, to reconcile us to the Father, to give us an abundant life, to give us a joyful life, to give us a liberated, emancipated life. It's the greatest thing that we can know. And so we come to his table in just a few minutes and remember the mission that he has accomplished. Let's prepare our hearts to come to his table. says in his word, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The scriptures tell us that he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and it's by his wounds that we are healed, for all we like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, and yet the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Will you now bow once again? before the king on high who martyred himself on the cross. On the very night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this bread is my body which is given for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. In like manner then, 
Our Savior took the cup and he poured it out and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. I drink it, take it in, this do in remembrance of me. And so, Christ has given us this sacrament, the benefits, the riches of the covenant of grace vividly portrayed before us this morning uh, in these simple elements. And so I asked you at the beginning of the service, how hungry are you? And now I say, come and dine. Come and dine at Christ's table. Uh, Take the sacrament into yourself as, as much as you would take in real food and real drink. Jesus said, this is my body. Uh, This is my blood. Eat it and drink it. And so we know we do that in a symbolic way uh, this morning, and yet it's powerful. The Spirit is here uh, amongst us, and real grace is poured out upon us as we partake of the sacrament. Let me pray for us, and then uh, we will partake of uh, the sacrament. Oh God, I pray you'd take this bread and this cup and set them aside from their ordinary use. And I I pray that they would become holy in a sense. While it's bread and while it is juice or wine, what it symbolizes is so profound, is so deep, is so rich that it transcends our full understanding. In a sense, the sacrament carries a mystery to it. And I pray that we would come in our brokenness, we would come in our neediness, we would come in our very bankruptcy, and that uh, we would once again dine upon the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who laid down himself gladly for us. And so, Father, uh, I pray that we would come in humility, that we would come in gladness, though, uh, that we would come, uh, Father, with this tremendous sense of emancipation, and deliverance for it's in Christ's name that we pray God demonstrates his love toward us in this while we were yet sinners Christ died for us what shall separate us from the love of Christ shall danger sword nakedness famine knowing all these things we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us and so the body of Jesus Christ. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of him. In the cup, his shed blood for you and for me, this do in remembrance of him. Let's pray together. Oh God, truly this is food indeed. For it's about forgiveness. It's about renewal. It's about being reborn. Father, it's about being with you forever in paradise through the sacrifice of your son Jesus. And so God, I I pray that we would grow and grow and grow in our intimacy uh, with you. Thank you for what you have done for us. You have made a way of salvation through faith in Christ and not by works. Let the fruit of your grace be good works done for you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, we do thank you for joining us this morning and um, we trust that you were blessed by the message today and um, anyway thank you in this virtual world Uh, we appreciate that you're here if you would like someone to pray for you or if you would like assistance on your faith journey we invite you to contact our church office the email address is church office at epcutah.org.
church office at epcutah.org. <laughs> Melissa staffs our office and she will be happy to connect with you and send you more information about the church and find out ways that we can support you. I would like to tell you about a wonderful opportunity coming up for Thanksgiving. Uh, we have the blessing to partner with Kaysville Rotary Club again this year to provide Thanksgiving dinner to 60 families at Francis Peak. The turkeys and the pies, like usual, are being donated, and we just need to fill in all the sides. If you receive our e-blast, there is a list on our e-blast of potential donations that could be made, and you can drop those off here at the church from 10 to 2, Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. We only have two weeks. Can you believe it? I mean, if you look outside today, it has been, it's been coming down here at the church, the whole service. But if you look outside today, it certainly feels like Thanksgiving. But we do have two weeks to be able to collect the um, sides and then package that up and deliver it to them. So it's a wonderful opportunity once again to extend the love of Jesus in in the holiday season. I'd also, speaking of extending the love of Jesus, I'd like to give you an update on our Operation Christmas Child activities and just let you know, our goal this year was 75 boxes and last count we had over 80 delivered to the church. I mean, Thank you, friends and family of Mountain Road. We so appreciate that. This is a missional activity. This is one way that we can spread the love of Jesus and the gospel, the good news around the world. Because when these boxes are sent to the various locations, what happens afterwards is that we're partnering with the local leaders there who have built friendships with the families and the children in their area. And they offer the kids to attend a discipleship program called The Greatest Journey. It's a 12-week discipleship program. Oh, sorry, 12-lesson <laughs> discipleship program where they learn more about the love of Jesus. And, and it just fits both of those volunteer activities today that I'm mentioning today are tangible ways that we can engage in being more missional from our church. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And that, are there any other announcements this morning? No? <laughs> All right. Well, once again, we hope that you have a blessed day and week ahead and may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen.